is our ultimate origin story. You know, we're all, uh, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but the older we get, we all kind of find these different interests. I don't know how many of you are into Ancestry.com. Anybody? Feels like most, uh, most, most men, when they turn 60, it all of a sudden feels like they're preparing for a World War II exam, right? You know, we just get fascinated with history. Uh, there's something to that because we're all trying to find our origin. We're all trying to find where it is that we started and where did we come from and what does that have to do with today? Uh, in fact, my wife's parents uh, just yesterday took our uh, two of our boys, our 12-year-old and 9-year-old, and they went to go visit San Antonio, went to go visit the Alamo. Uh, I don't know if you need to brush up on your Texas history, but we're going to do that for a moment. I, I, I had to do that because we're, we're on this, uh, we got a family text chain, you know, like you all do as well, and they tell us, you know, our boys are telling us, they're like, you know, we're at the Alamo, so excited, this is so cool, can't wait to see it, you know, because it's like battle and war and history, and so they're, they're down with that. And then they said, we're going to go in and watch the little video about what happened. And you just naturally think, well, it's Texas, so they won, right? And all we get on the text thread is, I'm currently shook, Texas sold. Which, what that means in teenage languages, let me translate that. There's this phrase that teenagers use. They say, if you blew it, or if you choked, or if you lost, what they say is, you sold the bag. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it comes from. I'm sure it's something from Fortnite. But all they told us was, Texas sold. And they were shocked. They were like, why are we going to visit this thing where Texas lost? And we had to help them understand, but that's the whole point, is that it was their courage and their valor that they stayed with it. And we can't forget that. We've got to remember the Alamo, right? And they were like, yeah, but we just wasted a lot of time watching an L, you know? I, we could, they couldn't believe it. They were, they were so floored with that. But that was, um, that's such a moment, though, in history and for so many people, it gives them their, their sense of freedom and their sense of courage and their sense of independence and their sense of fight. There's something powerful about looking back at our origin story, right? We have all kinds of movies that are passionate about this. Uh, in Avengers, what's the origin story in Avengers? I would say, I guess it's Captain America, right? Where they go back where he's frozen, right? Some of you are nodding along. Others of you are like, well, the last thing this world needs is another Avengers movie, right? Which I couldn't agree more. Um, there's a movie out right now. Has anyone seen the, the movie that's about the origin of Willy Wonka called Wonka, right? Same concept. It's about like, let's see from which he came. Let's see what made him. Let's see where he came from. That's what today's gonna be all about. Today's really all about us looking back at our origin, we're gonna look at Genesis. We're gonna look at the first book of the Bible. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you to grab one. We've got one that we would love to give you. If you wanna take it home with you, it is our gift to you. If you use technology to read the Bible, feel free to open up your Bible app. We're gonna put these words up on the screen as well. But the reason why this is so important is because if you don't know where you came from, it's hard to understand who you are. It's hard to understand what makes you, what drives you, what's built you. This is so important for every single one of us, not just with our own personal history, but Genesis helps define our origin story as humans. And so if you're a Jesus follower today, this is gonna be really relevant for you because this defines our faith. This is how it all began in our faith. But for those of you that maybe you're not even a Jesus person, maybe you're just here because somebody invited you, we just wanna say welcome, we're so glad that you're here. And my hope today is that maybe this would be like a pull back the curtain and let you see behind the scenes of, yeah, what, what, what does it mean that it all began with God? Be because it did, the big idea for today is real simple. The big idea for today, if you gotta leave early or if you gotta nod off or you're dreaming about something else today, here's the big idea, is that it all begins with God. It all begins with God. And this is a bit of a shock to some of our systems because we want it to begin with us, right? We want it to begin 
with me and with I and with you and with we. We want it to begin with us, right? But Genesis 1 teaches us something really profound, something very simple, but something very profound is that it all begins with God. And if it all begins with God, what, what does that mean for our today? What does that mean for us as we live today? You, you, you know this verse, but here's the, way, here's the way the Bible begins. This is the first verse in the Bible. Some of you memorized this as kids. Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, there was God. He had no beginning. He was there in the beginning, but we see him as a creator. Uh, Eugene Peterson in the message, I like the translation that the message gives us. He says it this way. He says, first this, before we go anywhere else, first this, God created the heavens and the earth, all you see and all you don't see. In the beginning, God created it all. In the beginning, before there was anything else, there was God. It, in a sense, what we understand from that is that all, all of life, all of life, your life, my life, every kind of life that we can imagine, all of life begins, it ends, and is fueled by. So it's the genesis of it, it terminates with God, but also all of life is fueled by God. But today, I, 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 wanna, I don't want to get into the, the creation side of that necessarily. I don't want to get into the, the how or the why. But really what I want to get into is the practical nature of that. So what? You ever sit in a sermon, sit in a lecture, sit in class? I remember sitting in college. My kids do it all the time. They ask the question, so what? Why am I learning this math, right? Why am I learning this English, this history, this health, whatever it is? So, so what? That's what I want to spend the remainder of our time on. So, so what? So it begins with God. So life is, begins, it ends, but in the meantime is also fueled by God. So what? How, how should that affect our lives? How should that affect the life that you're living, the life that I'm living? I, I deeply believe in the, the practical nature of sermons, of, of church, of moments like this. There's so much power, right? And I'm sure you've thought about this, but the potential at all times for life to change is remarkable. I, 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 don't, I don't know what motivated you to get up today and come and sit in a seat at Faith Bridge or what motivated you to come and watch online today or even what motivated you to maybe turn on the podcast and listen to the sermon today. But we can't lose the fact that you could hear something today. God could move in your life in some way today and your whole life could change. Isn't that remarkable? Just sitting in the seat that you're sitting in, life could change. All of life could change. And it doesn't mean your circumstances are gonna change, right? They might. But what it means is that there is so much power in God that he could change something, he could shift something, he could start something. And so I, I don't wanna lose that today. No, I, I wanna try to give you just, I'm gonna give you four reasons. These are just four things that I wrote down. That if it all begins with God, so what? If it all begins with God, well, then what should we do? If it all begins with God, well, how should we now live? Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, number one, numero uno. If it all begins with God, that was my attempt at being Anna. If it all begins with God, what he says about me is what's most important about me. If it all begins with God, then what he says about me is what's most important about me. I don't know what you would say is most important about you. I mean, when you meet someone, you say, oh, John, Mike, J Janice, good, good to meet you. What's the first question we normally ask people? 
what do you do, right? Which I love that question. What do I do just in general? What do I do? I do a lot of things, right? But we, we normally start with occupation, right? But we might eventually get to where are you from? You might eventually get to what, what, what was your family like? Where did you grow up? What was it like growing up? But what we rarely ask is what matters most to you? How do you see yourself, right? This is really a question of identity. It's a question of who you are. And some of you have been greatly shaped in a positive way by where you came from. And some of you, you you have made it your life's aim to be anything but where you came from, right? You're living in spite of where you came from. Some of you are fueled by it, and others are running from it. Either way, your identity, how you were formed, who you are, how you see yourself, is so incredibly important to how you live, right? Your life flows out of your identity, how you see yourself, how you think about yourself, how you carry yourself, how you picture yourself, and how you put yourself in the story of life. And so if it all begins with God, one of the things that we've got to first understand is if it all begins with God, if he's the essence, if he's the beginning and the end and everything is fueled by him, then what he says about you is ultimately what's most important about you. And and what we find him saying about us is that there's a lot that's good. It's one of the main things he says. And this is really important because the value of the creation is determined by the opinion of the creator, right? Some of you, you know this, but maybe you had a child and you thought that child was really great looking and someone told you that you did not have a cute baby (laughs) and you didn't care. Maybe it hurt your feelings at first, but you thought, well, forget that because I think this baby's cute. And as the creator of the baby, I get to determine, right, what's most important about this child. And I think this child is wonderful. And I think this child is tremendous. And I think this child is terrific. Yes, has a large forehead. Yes, has an odd look as a baby. But yes, this child is precious, right? My, my wife and I, we have five kids, and honestly, some of them, we were like, that. now that's a cute baby. Just subjectively, that's a cute baby. And then we had a couple other kids that we were like, well, we're just going to have to pray, you know, <laughs> because that's, um, they didn't come from great, I mean, they did with her, she's fantastic, but me, this is, it's a curse in, in a way. And, and, they, some, and they have grown out of it is the, the wonderful part of it. But the, the value, though, The value is not in the opinion of what other people think. No, the most important opinion is what the creator, the one who made, says about the creation. And so what we see in Genesis 1 is we see in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but then it goes on to say that God then creates, right? If you were to read the first chapter of Genesis, you would see uh, in verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? And the very next thing it says, God saw that that the light was light. Good. God just made, he's there creating. And he says, ah, look, light. And the light is good. This was the first day. And on the second day, God separated the waters and created essentially the atmosphere. In verse 10, God called the dry land land and gathered the waters together and called the seas seas. And God saw that it was good. He says it again. And then on day three, God creates the dry ground and creates vegetation and seed-bearing plants and trees and, and, and there's fruit with seeds in it and all various kinds and God saw that it was good. Day four, God separated the light and God made greater light. He made the sun and the moon and the stars, and he set them in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. This was the evening, and then the morning. That was the fourth day, and on the fifth day, God creates the birds and the sea creatures, 
and God saw that it was good. And on the sixth day, God creates land animals, and then he creates humans. And this is interesting, right? Because after the land animals, God says, verse 25, God saw that it was good. But over verse 31, God saw all that he had made. And after making these humans, God goes, aha. And he breaks the rhythm. He breaks the pattern It's not just good, no, God saw and said, this is very good. This is very good. This is remarkable. I I know you maybe have spent some time thinking about this, but we don't wanna make ourselves the center. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but at the same time, you know that God delights in you? This is a wild thought to think about. That the almighty God delights in his creation. He delights in you. When when, when we drop our kids off at school, I I, I try to mix it up and say different things, hoping that something will stick, right? So I don't always just say, have a great day, because I heard one dad the other day said, make it a great day. And I thought, ooh, I like that, right? That's better than just have a great day. So sometimes I'll mix that in there, right? But what I, one day I was dropping them off. This was when they were real little. And I remember thinking, what do I want them to think about today? If they're sitting there bored in class, somebody's hurt their feelings, they're lonely, maybe they're just not really thinking, they're just daydreaming. What do I want them thinking about? And I had this thought, well, what should I be thinking about today? I think the greatest thought that you and I could have today is that I am his and that he's mine. That God delights in me. That I would just think about his love. That I would not think about all the things I haven't done. That I wouldn't think about all the ways that I've fallen short. That I wouldn't think about all the ways that I've missed and all the things I'm missing out on. No, that I would be consumed with the fact that the almighty God delights in me. Have you ever been consumed with that? Have you ever just spent time in the morning meditating on that, that the almighty God, he delights in you? I'm telling you, when that becomes what is most important to us, when that becomes what is most important to you, life seems to get itself in order. Life seems to get itself into the proper position. No, because when we let other things get in the way, when we let other things get into the middle, it just doesn't go as well. Number two, here's number two. If it all begins with God, it would be better for us to do so as well, right? If God begins with God, shouldn't we also begin with God, right? I mean, if, if, if God has decided life is just better when I am the origin, wouldn't it be better for us if we would begin with God? What, what, what do we mean by that? Well. Do you begin your day with him? Do you begin your day thinking about him, talking about him? In fact, this is for me what I've decided to give up for Lent is looking at my phone first thing in the morning. Because that's just a habit that for me is just, it's, it's easy, it's normal, it's natural, but I just know my communion with him is just better when I start with him. When I say, hey, I'm going to begin with you. You began with you. Seems like I should begin with you. You you didn't begin with me, so why would I begin with me? No, you began with you, so maybe I should begin with you as well. What about in your finances? Do you begin with God in your finances? Have you prioritized him and the way you want to live financially? What about at work? Do you begin with him at work? Have you ever taken a moment, next time you walk into a big meeting, next time you walk into a hard conversation, next time you walk into maybe something that might even feel mundane or regular that you do, have you ever stopped and paused and said, Spirit of God, would you lead the way in this meeting? Would you lead me in this meeting? Would you just stop and say, we're going to begin with you? I mean, maybe you don't work in a place where you can say, hey, we're gonna start the day in prayer. We're gonna start the meeting in prayer. That's okay, you can pray on your own. You can pray in your own spirit. You can pray in your own heart. 
Do you start with him? Do you begin with him? I'm just telling you, if he begins with him, it seems like it would be better for us to do the same. Hey, here's number three. If it all begins with God, maybe I'm not the star of the show, right? Have you ever found this propensity in you? Have you ever noticed this? It is in all of us to play the lead role. It's in every one of us. It's in all of us to view life like this movie that's going on with I as the lead character, me as the lead role. It's natural for you to do the same. It's natural for you to live that way as well, for you to think about like life as, as well. And so if it all begins with God, maybe he is the star of the show, which means maybe I'm not the star of the show. You know the essence of the Bible? In the beginning, there is God, and you are not him. That's the essence of the Bible, is that you're not God. I'm not God. Now, don't you see in so many different areas of life and so many different people that you interact with that you can just tell, I, I, I think in your world, you are the God, right? What, what do we call that? I guess we call it, from a psychological standpoint, we call it narcissism, right? But it's in all of us. All of us are little mini narcissists that wanna just make it about us. Make it about me. Do you remember Rick Warren's famous book, Purpose Driven Life? Sold, sold more copies than any other nonfiction book other than the Bible? Remarkable. I mean, did so well. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got the wonderful opportunity to go preach at Saddleback, and they showed me this, the room in where he wrote the book. I'm like, he's down the hall. He's still here, but we're already enshrining this. Well, it's because it's made that big of a difference. It's been that big of a book. I would imagine most people here have either interacted with it in some way or maybe have a copy of it somewhere. Do you remember the first line of a purpose-driven life? Uh, let, let me give it to you. Here it is right here. Here's the first line. It's not about you. What a great line. What a great way to open up a book, right? To just come right out of the gate. Just want to let you know from the top, it's not about you. I thought that was so profound that he would start that way. It's not about you. No, it, it's about him. It's ultimately about Jesus, right? The, the Apostle Paul comes along and writes this. I, I, I want to read this section of Colossians. We're going to put it up on the screen, but I, I want to look at Colossians 1 for just a second because I love what he says about Jesus. He, he writes this beautiful diatribe about how Jesus is ultimately preeminent, that Jesus is ultimately the star of the show. Yeah, you're, you're not the star of the show. I'm not the star of the show. No, he is. Here's what he says in Colossians 1, verse 15. We're just gonna read a couple of these verses. He says, he is the image of the invisible God. One of my favorite ways to understand God, that Jesus is the icon. That word image means icon. That he is the image, the icon of the invisible God. In other words, he's the microcosm. If you wanna know what God is like, He's given us Jesus, his icon. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Look at what he says next. It's almost like you can see Paul going, how do I explain to them how big of a deal he is? Just read, meditate on the power of these words for a second. He says, for by him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. He's the engine, he's the power that created it, but he's also the end game. 
He's also the one in which it was created for. All things were created by him and for him. And then look at this, verse 17. He says, he is before all things, which I think means multiple things. He's before all things, meaning he existed before all things, but he's before all things also in the sense that he is the essence, he's the one that's held up, he's the highest, he's the one that all things bow down to, that he is the preeminent, he's the supreme. And then I love this, if you're going through something today, which all of us are in some level, in some form, right? If you've got something that's stressing you out, something that's worrying you, I hope this will give you some comfort. He says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. That when you're in him, all things are held together. It doesn't mean all things will work out, but it just means he brings meaning to them. He holds them together. He has control. He has the whole world in his hand. I'm telling you, if it all begins with God, you and I, we are not the star of the show. He is. He's the star of the show. This is why our origin story is, um, it's a little tricky, right? Because we can't just go back to Genesis 1 and look at our origin story because as we're about to see in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna get it wrong. We're gonna mess up, right? Sin is going to enter the world through Adam and Eve. And we're gonna be reminded as we were on Ash Wednesday that we came from dust and that we're going to dust if it were not for Jesus. That we started in death, made alive, and then we're gonna die again. And that would be our whole story if it were not for Jesus. And this is where he brings light and brings life into our story. Last one, number four. If it all begins with God, his purpose for me, his purpose for you is higher and better than my purpose for myself. If it all begins with him, his purpose is just better. His purpose is just greater. That sin doesn't have the last word, that death doesn't have the last word. God has put you on earth for a reason. There is breath in your lungs for a reason. There is a mission, there is agency on your life today. If you're still alive, if you're still breathing, it's not over. I don't know what's happened in your past. I don't know what you've come out of. I don't know how bad your weekend was. I don't know what life feels like right now. Maybe it feels like you're the one who's selling the bag. Maybe it feels like you're the one who's taking the L. And if that's the case, we have to be reminded today that if it begins with him, he has a purpose for us. He has a purpose for you. Here's what we see in Genesis 1, 28. This will be the last thing we'll read. He says this, he says, he gives us this purpose. He gives humans this purpose, right? He says that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. No one said amen. That's the fun part, right? Be fruitful and increase in number. And then secondly, he said, and fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth, but then subdue it. Bring order to it. Make life from it. Make it more fruitful. Organize it. Put it together in a way that it would flourish. What he's essentially saying is, I am life and I'm pouring my life into you and I'm giving you the opportunity to go bring life to others. And so he gives us this mission. He says, you have a mission. Go make things better. Just go make them better. Just go do something good for someone else. Go bring some life to someone else. Go subdue, go order life in such a way that it's more organized, that it's more free, that it's able to live up to its potential, that it has more encouragement and more inspiration. God has put that mission on your life. And if it begins with him, his mission is just better. It's just better than any mission, than any anything else that you or I could live for. And so I don't know where your spirit is today, but I hope we leave here today with our spirits lifted up that the almighty God began with himself and he invites us in 
to begin with him as well. That the almighty God has told you who you are. That the almighty God has said, Jesus is the star of the show and everything's gonna be okay because in him, all things are held together. And if it all begins with him, you got an opportunity today. You got an opportunity to go bring that same life to someone else. And so Almighty God, Heavenly Father, I pray that we would do that. I pray that we would do it with joy. I pray that you would free our spirit up to go bring life to others. God, for every single one of us that's prone to make it about ourselves, would you just caution us? Would you just help us to see it? Would you just give us eyes to be able to see in a way that we wouldn't otherwise see? Would you just help us to know when we're doing that? Give us creativity on how to make it about you. Give us that pause before we walk in, that pause before we step in to say, if it's about you, then I wanna be about you as well. And God, give us eyes to see what you've put us on earth for. Give us eyes to see the mission, the agency, the purpose that you've made for us and that you've made us for. And we celebrate you and we give you all the glory in all things. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.